Can you resolve a debate for us? Because Phil and I were, were debating this but just before we <laughs> oh. called you up, which is which is that um, could you write, not necessarily you, I'm not asking you, <laughs> would you write, but could one write or should one write a similar book about another magazine or newspaper? Um, would it carry the same heft? Would it, would it bring the same... Um, would it bring the same insights about, you know, liberalism? Uh, you know, if you wrote uh, the similar book about the New York Times or about the Guardian or the FT, for that matter, or the Spectator, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought no. Phil thought yes, but uh, I'm, I'm interested. What you're which uh, you're Phil? Which one did you? Because I'm curious about this. Which one did you think might 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 do it? I think the New York Times for sure, and um, possibly the Guardian as well. If we're talking about liberalism, yeah, there's a conference actually. The guard. The, there's there. They're having a, a conference about about the history of the Guardian at the uh, Goldsmiths or UCL somewhere at UCL uh, called Liberalism Incorporated, um, um, and I'm going to go to the conference so um, I can tell you what uh, you know. But I I was sort of like, what is this Liberalism Incorporated? I mean, this book's been written about the Economist, so yeah, I've had to think about this too. What would the story that I wanted to tell look like if told through the Guardian? I don't think it, I don't think the Guardian is nearly as central uh, uh, to to the history of liberalism, uh, but I think it is. It would be a fascinating. You would, you know, learn something about a particular kind of strand of liberalism. And then in America, of course, the Times would be, it would be incredible to write a book about the Times, which, which is something. You know, I, in terms of, in terms of trigger, you know, you said the Economist is triggering. It, of course, it is. But I don't know. I don't actually know. I think I don't know if I would have survived the level of triggering that would have happened for me uh, in the history of the Times, because that's something that you know. It's part of my breakfast and my coffee, and you know I I can't get through two headlines at this <laughs> point. You know it's like, uh, uh, do you find that uh, the, I, I the, Guardian, it, the Guardian, the Guardian, the Guardian, definitely, the Guardian I mean, definitely, especially the yeah. brain rot that is their uh, comment pages. Just, oh, uh, Lord, I yeah. think I think you were actually very um, very wise doing it for a weekly publication because <laughs> if you had to read seven times as much. I was going to say, I think also, I mean, for whatever it's worth, I think um, I think actually the New York Times is a better newspaper just objectively than oh, The Guardian. vastly, vastly, yes. It's not that, it's not the quality. The thing about The Guardian is that the quality is so low, as yeah. well as the fact that it, like, <laughs> plays such a negative role yeah. in, in British <laughs> politics and ideas. Yes, but in exactly. the, the New York Times, is, the New York Times is extremely well written. And it's a it's a more ample paper. I mean, the Guardian yes, is pretty, exactly. it's pretty thin pickings over there. Yeah. But the thing about the Times is that it you know um, it so rigidly enforces this 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 particular vision of American empire. And I do sort of want to write something about this. If you guys have suggestions about how to go about, it, I'd be I'd be into hearing about it. But the, the 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 you know the coverage of obviously Russia Gate and the impeachment trial is one thing. But then there's there's just this kind of uh, general way in which um, you know the duties and responsibilities of the of, of 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 America as an imperial power are talked about in the Times, and of course, of, mm. of course, they're they're after they're after they're after Sanders. But I mean, the shamelessness of the Times at its at its worst. I mean, they're asking Sanders if he's Amazon Prime to try and catch him in a <laughs> catch him out, or you yeah. know, or, or or ask him where, whether he sends birthday cards or something. I mean, basically, it just makes him look good. The the the, the Guardian is, I think, or British media in general is is a bit more uh, deceitful. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 I, mean I, 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 I don't. I, what do you think? I mean, the the the, the attacks on Corbyn, the, the level of vitriol directed at him, nothing nothing like it so far has arrived. Uh, yeah, uh, for Sanders, they're not very they're not very professional and they're not very um, they're just a bit un a bit unhinged. I think. Yeah, I think Brexit I think Brexit has um, has done a number on them, and I think it's it, their some of the fixed points of their worldview. Some of these this common these kind of end of history or Blairite commentary out of people, they're just they're just they they've got nothing to lose because their their mental sort of framework is disintegrating. So when they see Corbyn, they're like, he's from the past, he's from the future. We don't know. He's you know they throw anything at him. So I, I think like also the the Guardian seems to be much like it feels like it's not at home in its own country anymore because of Brexit and whatever. Like where you know, where do we <laughs> yeah. live? Whereas the right. New York Times still expresses a certain comfort of American liberalism as still the hegemonic power, and it still feels at home in the U.S. Albeit you know there are some deplorables out there which it would maybe rather get rid of but um but yeah, right, yeah it's right. a really good point 
And under Alan Rusbridge's editorship as well, The Guardian has tried, explicitly tried to go global and to speak for global liberalism, kind of soaking up, I guess, um, not being the bourgeois paper of record the way the New York Times styles itself. But um, it's, you know, it's certainly kind of, it, I think Alex is absolutely right. It has a certain kind of um, distaste and distance from its own country, which I think is different from the tone of the Times, um, mm. despite its kind of hatred for the deplorables. Um, so, I mean, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it would be um, even a comparison, I mean, of these kinds of papers would be fascinating as well. Yeah, I think it doesn't yeah, try well, to be I mean, a paper of record because uh, it makes so many fucking mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> the quality's not there. <laughs> All right, hello, welcome everybody to Alpha Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. Today, we're very happy to welcome Alexander Zevin, who's a professor at the City University of New York, an editor at the New Left Review, and more importantly, the author of Liberalism at Large, a history of The Economist magazine, which I've hugely enjoyed reading. Thanks for having me on. So you've written this book, this history of the Economist, which is a which builds itself as a newspaper, even though most people would see it as a magazine, which, as most people will know, features almost exclusively unsigned articles from around the globe, uh, and which has been around for 175 years, defending, promoting laissez-faire liberalism. Uh, Marx famously described it, as you mentioned in the book, as the, described the publication as the aristocracy of finance. I think it's like it's a bit of superb research, and it's laid out in such a way that the magazine really is able to speak for itself. Only occasionally are critics brought in, such as Marx, or do you make comments here and there, illuminating certain contradictions. But it's more than just a book about a magazine, which you know follows the editorships as they shape the magazine, uh, going into the personal biographies of the various editors. But it does mean a lot greater than that, which is. Uh, it's able to tell a story about actually existing liberalism, I think, which gives us a grounding of what that ideology is about, perhaps much better than examining the works of a specific philosopher or the actions of governments or parties, which would probably all be too temporally restricted or restricted to a certain geographical context. So just to trail the uh, main themes before I bring you in, Alexander, so that our readers are aware, you start the book by asking, how would liberals respond to the rise of democracy, the expansion of empire, the, and the ascendancy of finance, none of which figured in the core doctrine um, as liberalism was expounded in the 17th and 18th centuries? You end the book by, I guess, concluding that the dominant was always a liberalism whose lodestars were two, the universal virtues of capital and, where they arose, the particular necessities of empire. The most enduring embodiment of the former was finance, the most important of the latter, Britain, and then the United States. Other considerations had to be taken into account, among them, in due course, the will of the people. But where they conflicted, that will was not to stand in the way. So very clearly uh, siding with finance and empire at the expense of democracy whenever was necessary. So before we get into this whole discussion, uh, and also look at the the history of the Economist and the history of liberalism as expressed by the Economist magazine. Uh, I thought we'd start off by asking you about any low points that you found in the course of your research, things that the Economist might have got completely wrong, completely incorrect, um, or if you have a favorite of these. I mean, I, I liked uh, one that you drew up, uh, stating that uh, Thatcher would fail or might fail because she would only provoke the trade unions, leading to an angry return of the Labour Party in 1984, which obviously was proved wrong on that. But I, I'm sure there's various of those. But what are your favorites, Alexander? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for that excellent uh, overview of the book. Uh, I, the, the the mistakes that The Economist has, you know, I've, I've seen the book presented now in, in this way by, by several commentators, including David Runciman in the Financial Times, who spoke about what it is that the economist has gotten right and what it's gotten wrong, uh, and uh, of course there are some spectacular examples of them being wrong in terms of their predictions. So, um, you know, obviously the Irish famine 
uh, would be almost the original sin of, 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 of the liberal worldview espoused by the economist in terms of, of thinking that uh, throwing open uh, Ireland to free trade would somehow solve the Irish famine. This was, in fact, the reason that the Corn Laws were abolished uh, at the precise time that they were. Um, so the connection between the rise and triumph of free trade uh, uh, and and uh, the really uh, you know um, the, the genocide uh, uh, of Irish peasants uh, are, are connected. So um, perhaps that's the ultimate wrong call. Uh, but there are others. Uh, there there are um, political prognostications that are incorrect. For example, around uh, Louis Napoleon. So um, I like this one in particular because the resonances with today, where the Economist has just championed Emmanuel Macron so hard, right, um, putting him on yeah. their cover multiple times, um, is extremely reminiscent to me of their enthusiasm for Louis Napoleon, um, and really a somewhat exceptional enthusiasm because, of course, if anyone, uh, and I'm sure many of your listeners have read The 18th Brumaire, Marx can't stop himself from making fun of Louis Napoleon and, you know, calling him plan plan, uh, making fun of his weight, uh, 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 his air, his sort of, you know, his assumption of the air of his much uh, more famous predecessor, um, when in fact his, his mental abilities, physical abilities, and um, certainly his military acumen were, you know, decidedly uh, uh, inferior. Uh, so I think that, that the, the kind of championing of Louis Napoleon, the prediction that he would never start or respond to a war uh, provoked by Bismarck uh, and Prussia, um, the prediction that uh, his uh, adventure in Mexico um, would would uh, turn out uh, uh, to benefit uh, European bondholders and uh, the entire region. Um, that's that's one kind of prolonged episode of 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 of, of getting it wrong. Um, uh, but there there are, there are many others. I mean, I, I, the list goes on. I would just say though that the 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 only thing I, I would resist is is simply saying that the economist is 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 wrong and leaving it at that. Because I think what's interesting is that is the, are the reasons that the economist is wrong. Why is it that the economist champions um, free trade in Ireland even when this seems uh, to fail as a practical solution to the famine? Why is it that the economist is so um, keen on Louis Napoleon even if he turns out to be an adventurer uh, uh, and, and a disaster? Uh, you, so, so I think that's that. Those are the connections that I want to make. Even when the Economist is wrong, and it is often wrong because it's a weekly news magazine, after all, uh, it's wrong for interesting reasons that reveal something bigger about the history of liberalism. Yeah, absolutely. And your uh, kind of rendition of what the Economist has thought over the course of the ages is a very faithful uh, rendition and generous. Uh, generous, I guess, not not necessarily to its views, but generous in the in the sense that you give a lot of space for it to expound its views. Uh, through your book, uh, and and that are able to bring through those uh, those motivations behind those decisions to light, um, and and as you say, I think I mean the Economist obviously sees itself as a very serious paper, and in many regards is serious insofar as that it's not uh, it's rarely hysterical, um, and it tries to be take a high minded and principled view on things, even if it's. Uh, even if we might find that it's completely contradictory or whatever, but um, it, it certainly tries to return to first principles. I mean, I think you mentioned at several points that several editors would, you know, re return uh, to editorial meetings, and when an argument would break out, they would return to discuss, you know, okay, what are the first principles? What 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 is the liberal response to such and such a world event? Um, and I think you bring that through very nicely. So. Before we go any further into the historical narrative, I wanted to ask you how you came to write the book. Um, could you give us a brief account of, of the genesis of it? <laughs> what interested you? Yeah, I think you know it at the beginning that it started as an article, became a thesis, and then became a book. Um, but why The Economist? Uh, I, I could personally, just on a personal note, I, I would have loved to have written this book until I actually read it and then realized just the, the sheer amount of research that's gone into it. So I'm glad someone else has done it. Um, <laughs> but at least my motivation would be uh, just being... Well, I guess triggered is the right word, triggered by The Economist on so many occasions that I've been driven to write a book. And I wondered if it was the same with you. Uh, yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. I, I should be held to account for doing something so deeply eccentric as having written a book about The Economist uh, uh, a magazine. Uh, um, 
especially because it took me so incredibly long to write, or at least it felt that way to me about seven years uh, or, or, or a bit more. Uh, the, the project started out as, as, as a journal article for Le Monde Diplomatique uh, in France. I was living in, in France. I was studying French history. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a somewhat romantic disposition as regards to the revolutions that have taken place in France repeatedly uh, and, you know, are echoed even now in the level of protest at the uh, attempt by the French government to reform the pension system in France in a deeply uh, unfair way. Uh, so I was there and I had uh, become friendly with some of the writers around the Monde Diplomatique, which is a great uh, a paper for those those of your listeners who, who may, may not have heard of it, or perhaps they're all um, devoted readers, um, they had asked me to do a number of pieces um, about um, think tanks, uh, about the sort of the spread of ideas and the way that, that that works. And they, like you, were particularly incensed and triggered by The Economist, which for a long time now, going all the way back to Louis Napoleon, um, have found France to be a kind of thorn in uh, Anglo-Saxon mm. versions of ideas about uh, the way a state should relate to the market and the sorts of reforms that the French state should carry out. Uh, so um, obviously the history of that is, is complex, but that was kind of the background to, to, to them asking me to do this. And I hadn't been particularly um, uh, sort of interested in that subject uh, 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 up till that point. Up till then I was working on uh, 1968 and the kind of encounter between students and workers. And, and I'd go on from there to do something on existentialism and uh, decolonization. So in a, in a funny way, this, this book project started as a detour, one that I thought would be brief. Um, but actually, as I, as I started to work on it, it became clear to me um, not only how fascinatingly central The Economist and its editors have been at various key turning points in the story of liberalism, but also that the story had gone largely untold. Uh, there were all sorts of archives that no one had ever looked at um, to do with individual editors at Oxford and Cambridge, also some held at the, uh, at the Hoover Institute at Stanford. Uh, uh, so it just became a kind of fascinating case of, mm -hmm. of, of pulling at a string and realizing that, that there was so much um, more there. And, and it also dawned on me that through The Economist, I could do something that, that did interest me a lot, which was to try and actually nail down a history of, of liberalism uh, as a body of thought that, that treated it as a coherent system, since so much of what's been written about liberalism is, you know, um, kind of diffuse and incoherent. It, it depends sort of on what it is that the individual political theorist wants or thinks liberalism should be. Uh, you know, it's oh well, it's a bit yeah. of Kant and it's a little bit of Locke and you know, two 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 smidges of of mm -hmm. Rawls or whatever it. You know, it's this kind of weird potion that is generally always positive and and often very uncritical, but even more so is just kind of. Um, you know, n n n not well defined. So I thought that I could actually use the Economist to to, to tell a story that would interest even people who may, uh, you know, who may be unable to get through a single issue of the Economist because they are so irritated by, uh, you know, <laughs> by it tonally or by its politics, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. And if, and if you do like reading the Economist, and you know, you have the sensation that the, you know. These, these issues pile up and you never read them, you know, well, I've read 176 years of them. So, you know, I can catch you up. <laughs> yeah, no. It, yeah, I think. It, go ahead. It, yeah, no, it, I think it comes through really clearly that one of the things that I guess a project like this allows you to do is think about some of the distinct periods of liberalism or at least liberalism in, in practice, as opposed to the history of liberal political thought, which is um, maybe something different entirely. Um, but yeah, to maybe sort of dig into that historical narrative a little bit. The, I mean, how would you describe this, the, the founding moment or the first um, phase in the history of The Economist? Um, sort of what 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 provoked this, the, this um, uh, publication into life and what was the, you know, what were the situations at that time? Right. So, you know, 
the 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 basically the the situation the the, the word liberal travels um, you know kind of it it, it becomes a, a, a a way of describing one politics in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars uh, uh, in Spain in France but in Britain it takes on a, a certain um, a synthetic quality or synthesizing political and economic concepts of freedom uh, uh, and there's a reason that the Economist is founded in Britain and not, nowhere else. Uh, it's a unique moment. On the one hand, you have the triumph of the Anti-Corn Law League in the context of the Industrial Revolution, uh, and you have the defeat of the Chartist movement, what uh, Engels called the first proletarian party. So it's it's this kind of uh, moment, uh, 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 if you like, in the 1840s, in which the Economist emerges to push the agenda not just of the Anti-Corn Law League, although James Wilson, its founder, is effective at getting the Anti-Corn Law League to back his nascent publication, but the wider worldview of those who want to remove government from interference in the economy. Um, uh, and ma- it's important to know that Wilson uh, starts out as a hat manufacturer. Uh, he, he is the son of a Scottish um, textile manufacturer. Uh, uh, and like many self-made men, he inherits quite a lot of money from his father. Uh, he moves to London. He, he, he begins to, 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 to start, he starts his own factory with his brother. He soon begins to, to speculate in, in, in commodities like indigo, loses a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the story is interesting in itself, but he becomes interested in this kind of broader issue of, 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 of free trade, uh, and becomes politically active with the Anti-Corn Law League in fighting for mm. the repeal of the corn laws. And I, I could go into the, what those were a little bit, but this is the kind of um, context for that moment that the, that the economist is, is, is founded. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about what makes it uh, unique if, if I haven't already kind of rambled too much. It, it that would be useful, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, just, just quickly though, it sounds like this uh, speculator in Indigo. I mean, that that sounds like a sort of a tech firm that somebody would speculate in today. But it's an inter- He's an interesting character, isn't he? The the Scottish hat maker. I uh, think also um, the uh, Corn Laws as well. I think is you know that would be uh, uh, useful for um, just to ensure all our listeners are on the same page as well. Yeah, completely. Okay, so the Corn Laws. What is the Anti Corn Law League? What are they fighting? They're fighting the Corn Laws. The Corn Laws are imposed in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 to keep grain prices up in, uh, in Britain because there's a, there's a fear among the landowning class, which, uh, of course, dominates uh, British politics uh, uh, in Parliament, um, that uh, with the end of the war, there will be a flood of cheap grain uh, from, from Europe, the value of their land uh, and their profits. Will 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 tumble. So it's a it's a it's a classically protectionist measure, and it um, uh, uh, becomes the object of, of of a real campaign on the part of the rising middle class in Britain to to get rid of. Uh, uh, it's seen as a vestige of aristocratic privilege, of monopoly, uh, and it's everything that uh, uh, a follower of Adam Smith uh, would have opposed. So that's the, the kind of uh, that's the struggle, uh, uh, isolated struggle of the of the anti corn law league and uh, the, the 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 free trade movement in Britain is to get rid of those of those corn laws. I mean, it's interesting also thinking about that period. Um, the way I mean, firstly, as you've already mentioned about the defeat of Chartism actually creating the space for a much more self-assertive liberalism in a way that wouldn't have happened in France. And uh, as you already discussed a little bit before that, you know, throughout the the middle part of the 19th century, The Economist regularly fulminates against France um, for representing perhaps not a not a fully complete liberalism in the way that had been achieved in Britain because of the progress of industry and the power of um of finance there as well um i think one editor talks about the the infancy or the childishness of of <laughs> french finance uh, condescendingly mm. um but it, interestingly i think and and here you start to maybe to bring in the way that the economist treats the state and state intervention in uh in the uh, in the economy, um, you mentioned Herbert Spencer, um, who for listeners, I mean, he popularized into you know, the uh, social Darwinistic ideas. Um, 
survival of the fittest. That's what I was looking for, the survival of the fittest. Um, yeah. Uh, and who was an editor for a while at The Economist and who noted with with horror, I think in a book which you say sounds like an, edit, an economist leader, uh, a dystopia of state spending with public ballrooms, gratis concert, cheap theaters, with state paid actors, musicians, masters of ceremonies, <laughs> um, as if that's the that's the grandest dystopia that he could uh, possibly imagine. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about yeah, yeah. how The Economist saw the state in these uh, these early periods. So, so the the early economist. This was one of the most the fun the most fun chapters to write because the uh, 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 you know the early economist doesn't pull its punches. It says exactly what it means, and what it what it means is often um, you know it's 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 quite shocking to our to 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 our modern sensibilities. And I think modern readers of the the contemporary readers of the economist would would also be shocked. This is the most virulent form of laissez faire. Uh, liberalism anywhere in the world, and there's a there's a kind of sense that I had always uh, gotten from the historiography that laissez-faire liberalism is a bit of a misnomer. That 19th century liberalism, uh, it, you know, did, this was uh, you know exaggerated, you know, but the Economist does embody it. And mm. the 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 quotation you have from Herbert uh, Spencer is is, is great. Uh, and one of the th- even though Spencer is uh, far better known than Wilson, it, it's arguably uh, 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 Wilson that influences Spencer, and it's, it's Spencer's time working at the early Economist that that pushes him to articulate um, his particular form of of, of social Darwinism um, based on the kind of uh, a sense that the Victorian order of of, of laissez faire is, is a bit like the animal kingdom and will produce the best outcomes uh, if you let everyone sort of go at each other and tooth and claw. Uh, uh, I, I mean, there, there are a number of examples I could give you of, of, of the way in which the economist opposes state intervention in the economy. Some of them I've already mentioned, um, the Irish famine being the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, absolutely central case where the economist opposes any form of state loan to, to, uh, to buy grain, uh, to alleviate uh, uh, suffering in Ireland, any form of state intervention, when it, it, uh, whether it be a soup kitchen or the building of roads, uh, i.e. I- outdoor relief, that's yeah, not even, any good Even either. charity, right? I, that, was, uh, that, one, that struck me probably the most of, out of all of them, because you can imagine all these uh, horrific things that The Economist says that this, you know, the state shouldn't do, that there should be no public provision of all these different things. But it, it even stands against uh, charity. And it's interesting because contemporary libertarians will often uh, suggest charity as a solution to fill the gap of where state provision used to be with, you know, the withdrawal of the state, according to their vision of, of how politics should be. So even the economists even objected to charity schools. Yeah, yeah. They, in other words, they, they, they not only, just to be clear, they not only object to state schools, that, that is a monstrosity not to be considered. They object to charity schools, meaning voluntary schools, people who are offering to educate. Why do they do this? They do this. Why do they object to it? They object to it because um, if, if, if the working class can expect to have their, the products of their, um, you, you know, um, uh, 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 unions um, educated, well, then they'll be even uh, uh, more, you know, in, inclined to fornicate than uh, if the state uh, uh, offered nothing or uh, whether uh, or if individuals, uh, charitable individuals offered nothing uh, whatsoever. You know, the economy, there's great lines like uh, we know nothing worse than uh, a, a great many people rushing to do good. Um, that they, they, you know, they, they say that there are worse things in, in terms of sanitation, public, you know, there's cholera outbreaks in central London uh, um, or, or, or in, in slums. And um, the economist opposes any form of sewage treatment of, the, of any form of trash collection on the part of the state. You know, they say some, there's a line uh, that I'm going to paraphrase, uh, you know, uh, we know things w- worse than um, cholera, which is a mental imbecility. You know, in other words, the <laughs> people must be taught self-reliance. You have to you cannot rely on the state to breed those habits that are required of a good liberal subject, which is self-reliance, which is looking after one's own interest, whether that is uh, picking up after oneself or or, or um, dealing with the consequences of, uh, of, of an outbreak of, of some plague. So, so the, the, this gives, I mean, I, I simply do let the economist speak for itself by and large in 
this portion of the book in the 1840s and early 1850s because the positions that they take as regards uh, uh, charity schools and sanitation, the Irish famine, or, 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 and, uh, and other things like that are really, I mean, they really drive the point home that laissez-faire was real and that it um, was a coherent and a, a deeply scary uh, a worldview. So maybe you should tell us then how, because we do need to kind of zoom forward a little bit in history, how this period comes to an end and how maybe it adopts a slightly more activist vision um, than than just a merely laissez-faire one as it did in the 1840s. Um, and maybe bring in uh, its relationship to empire, I guess, at that time, because I might uh, clarify or illuminate a little bit this question. Yeah. Cool. Great. So there, I think there are two steps. One uh, has to do with empire and one has to do with, with finance. Um, the early uh, editor of The Economist, James Wilson, um, he ends up having a falling out with his former friends in the Anti-Corn Law League who have always argued, this, these, are figures like John, these are figures like John Bright and Richard Cobden, uh, these figures have always argued that uh, 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 free trade equals peace and, and peace equals free trade, that these two things are connected. Wilson, who enters government in 1847 and becomes a, an extremely high-ranking official within the British state at the Treasury, eventually he's sent to India, where he is tasked with basically making the Indians pay for the cost uh, of, of the Indian mutiny uh, 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 in 1857. Um, he he um, uh, ends up taking the line that empire is an absolute necessity. And war, far from being a regrettable, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, thing, might actually be necessary to bring, a bra- bring about a world in which free trade, uh, um, in which free, in which free trade reigns. So um, this this uh, this happens not only when it comes to the Crimean War, one of the most significant uh, conflicts uh, uh, b- between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the First World War, uh, but also uh, when it comes to the opium wars uh, in China, uh, uh, that the, that sometimes people are going to have to be forced to trade freely. So this is the first, if you like, break in the early version of laissez-faire, because in the first few years, Wilson is adamant that even when it comes to diplomacy, you know, laissez-faire should reign. He makes a proposal that the entire diplomatic core, dominated, of course, by aristocrats, be dismissed and replaced with merchants. That's a flavor of the of the early of the early positioning of, of uh, on this issue of war and peace. So okay, by the 1850s that is gone. The next step though comes with the rise of financialized capitalism, or at least that's what I argue uh, in Britain, and uh, the ascent of uh, Wilson's successor as editor Walter Badgett, uh, who is uh, you know generally looked on as a kind of impish wit and rake who commentated on uh, the English constitution, uh, which is something else we could talk about in light of Brexit and what what he had to say about that. But he is a banker. And uh, as a banker, he sees very clearly that there is a role for the state to play in uh, dealing with the uh, effects, basically, of financial crises, of crises of investor confidence, but also crises to do with the money supply. So in contrast to Wilson, uh, who, you know, uh, takes a a position in in this debate over the currency that basically says, again, let's say fair applies to the money supply, i.e. banks should, individual banks should have a right to issue as many notes as they want. And for Badgett, just to give you an example of the way that the focus on finance changes the vision of what the state should or should not be doing, Badgett says, actually, no, what we want in terms of money is fixity of value. Yes, competition is very good when it comes to lowering the costs of production, but that can't be really held to be the case when it comes to money. What we want is fixity of value. What we need is a central bank. So I think with empire and with finance, you see the economist is forced by the actual crises of capitalism and of the need to find new markets, spread free trade, to, to, to modify its original kind of virulent version of, it, of laissez-faire. So 
Um, I mean, I'd love to talk more about the later part of the 19th century, um, but maybe we should move forward to the 20th century, as well, otherwise we'll uh, run out of time. Um, maybe I should pass over to Phil, actually, who had a, who had a particular question. I mean, now we're jumping forward to, uh, to the 1940s, I guess, but, but Phil, go ahead. Yeah, one of the interesting things you've picked up on is the um, interesting kind of range of characters. So not only the leading lights of um, 19th century liberalism, such as um, Herbert Spencer and um, Badger, as you mentioned, but also that it's had some interesting leftists write for it as well. And most notably, um, Isaac Deutscher, the great um, Polish Marxist and um, famous biographer of Trotsky. Um, who is uh, a European correspondent for um, for The Economist. Uh, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. And also, um, I was just, uh, funnily enough, while you, um, when I got your book, I've also been reading a collection of Deutsch's writings um, uh, from the Cold War period, which is was edited by Fred Halliday. Um, it's a great collection, sadly out of print, but um, but what's really interesting about it, so is so it's um, and then just before this interview, um, just before our chat now, I went back to that book of Isaac Deutsch's writings and I was looking through it to see if any of his pieces were taken from The Economist, and none of them are. So they're all um, syn- they're all extracts from syndicated columns that he wrote for other newspapers and magazines all over the world, and but I mean it's remarkable, like absolutely scintillating analysis which frequently kind of turns the conventional Cold War um, narrative on its head in particular contexts. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about Isaac Deutscher, but also I was wondering if there is, um, you know, like a kind of a readily accessible archive, an easy way to access um, the stuff that he wrote for The Economist, because I'm sure it would be fantastic. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question about Deutscher, and that was another um, a wonderful discovery Basically, The Economist in the late 30s and early 40s is one of at, at one of its most intellectually diverse uh, stages. There's a sort of a Catholic socialist or left wing Catholic like uh, Barbara Ward, who ends up taking a turn to the right uh, with the advent of the Cold War. Uh, and there are a number of, 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 of Marxists. Uh, Isaac Deutscher is first and then later on Daniel Singer, another Another comrade of Deutscher's that comes on board and is uh, the Paris correspondent of The Economist for a long time. Uh, Deutscher wrote hundreds and hundreds of articles uh, for The Economist interpreting Russia and Eastern Europe, about which he was an expert. Uh, and, uh, you know, along with um, E.H. Carr at The Times, I think both the presence of both E.H. Uh, uh, Carr at The Times, who also obviously wrote about Russia promote an alliance between a permanent alliance between Britain and the Soviet Union, and then uh, a Deutscher at The Economist, we see a moment quickly close uh, with, with the end of the Second World War, um, but uh, a window into a, a, a more ideologically um, uh, diverse uh, um, presence within these kind of voices of the um, British ruling class uh, uh, um, and these kind of tribunes of, of, of capital. Is there um, in, in, is there an edited collection to be made out of uh, Deutsch's so, writings for The Economist? So there, I came across, a, funnily enough, I came across a collection where I found a list of, of titles um, uh, uh, that, um, that, that, that formed the basis of my, my research. But I don't know if there, I don't believe there is a, 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 any collection. There, there's, a, there's someone I, I know who's working on a, a biography of Deutscher, and he may, he may know the answer to that question. Uh, uh, it may be that Deutscher has has basically a record that, that the, in Deutscher's papers, there's a record of all, everything he wrote um, for for the Economist. I was just going to say that there's a great story about uh, Deutscher um, in in Germany at the end of the war. He comes across Orwell, who is 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 writing yeah. uh, columns as well. I love and, this. Uh, I don't know if you came. Across, yeah, you, <laughs> did you come across this story yeah, too in the go, holiday? Class? Go ahead. Go yeah. Go ahead. no no. I, tell us. Tell us. Yeah. Uh, it, it basically. Um, it, it's a. It, I th- the title of the piece is something like, what is it? It's like the, the the mysticism the of cruelty. cruelty. Yeah, the mysticism, mysticism of cruelty. cruelty. Yeah. Right, and he, you know, for, he doesn't have a entirely. He doesn't have a very high opinion of, of Orwell's um, sort of dystopian musings in 1984, but he 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 finds him at a at a camp where journalists are are bivouacked 
uh, uh, talking about, you know, in a, what he considers to be an extremely paranoid way, the plot on the part of the, the big three to divide up the world between them themselves and, and basically rule rule the world a little bit like Big Brother. And Deutscher points out to him that, you know, the, sort of the, the 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 divisions between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, not to say not not, uh, not not to mention Britain, are already becoming apparent, and it, it becomes basically a, 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 this kind of this this moment of Deutscher as a journalist encountering Orwell as a journalist becomes a a way of talking about this very kind of grim, merciless, and ultimately deeply paranoid and incorrect vision of what the Cold War might be. And I, I really liked that moment because it, it, it managed to connect these these contrasting worldviews to, to 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 what it is that both of them did kind of when they weren't producing the the works that they're best known for. And just quickly, another um another leftist more um more contemporary is um who also wrote for The Economist. And I suppose um so you mentioned um Deutsche was writing in a more kind of ideologically um a diverse period for the Economist. So the other leftist, more recent, is Seamus Milne, who has attracted mm. a lot of notoriety as a senior political advisor, strategy advisor to um, Jeremy Corbyn, um, mm. and is still working at a very senior um, post in the Labour Party despite the electoral defeat um, last year. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about Seamus Milne's stint, stint at the Economist and what that tells us about the kind of people the Economist was employing at that particular point. Well, I think. Uh, <laughs> It's it's a it's um in terms of social class background, uh, Seamus Milne wouldn't have been entirely out of place uh, at, at at the Economist, and in terms of educational background, uh, the, the same. Of course, ideologically, uh, he was he was far to the left. But as that quote about Thatcher uh, that you read, the the kind of the fact that the Economist wasn't really on board with the Thatcher Revolution when it began indicates there was something up for grabs in the early 1980s. There was a disorientation uh, among the among the kind of um, the, 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 the center, the centrist mainstream liberal press. Um, you know, there was a sense that Heath had uh, had blown it, that his confrontational stance with the unions actually led to uh, another labor government being returned, and there was a, a quite a bit of dispute within the Economist about what the best approach would be. Some uh, 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 editors of the Economist, including Simon Jenkins, who was there at the time, ended up backing the um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the the Social Democrats, uh, 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 now the, the Liberal Democrats, um, uh, and the Breakaway Party, uh, led by, by by Roy Jenkins. So um, this. Uh, I, I, I interpreted Milne's presence there as being part of this. He was very young at the time, um, but but that his presence there was part of this kind of moment of of flux when it wasn't clear right. whether the Thatcher Revolution would be a revolution, even mm. amongst those who would eventually work to make it hegemonic. It's a bit like you know you imagine Stuart Hall at Marxism Today tra- talking about the Great Moving Right show, but within the within the behind the scenes there was a certain um, you know, there are other reasons for that, but they're behind the scenes at, at, the, it, it, or, or bit, that, in, I'm trying to get the metaphor right. The, the, if you pull back the curtain, um, backstage, there yeah. was a, a certain degree of, 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 of confusion. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, and Seamus, uh, you know, who I interviewed for the book had, um, some interesting things to say about what he, uh, uh, uh took from that, from that, from that moment. Mm, interesting. So, uh, as a way of moving on and, and trying to retake up the historical narrative moving towards the present day, uh, I think we should probably talk a little bit about the 1930s and 40s, maybe just briefly, uh, when the economists came to terms with a greater role for the state. Um, you note that in the 1930s, nowhere was the paper's mixture of bold calls for experimentation and reluctance to depart from pre-war norms more striking. So that's in reference to, for example, to the gold standard. Um, how does it uh, overcome these uh, the, this reluctance to depart from pre-war norms? And how does it come to adopt uh, policies, for example, even like full employment, uh, which it maintained well into the second half of the 20th century, and which, reading The Economist today, seems really striking that the same magazine could have adopted those positions? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think... <laughs> 
I, I tend to believe that liberals take up positions when they are forced to by uh, uh, or, or strong social movements and or uh, war or some other form of, um, of, of ineluctable crisis. And I think that the, uh, the, the, the endorsement on the part of The Economist of for employment has a longer and shorter set of causes. The longer cause is the fact that starting in the uh, early 1930s, um, a number of Keynes's students uh, at Cambridge joined The Economist. Indeed, the editor, Walter Layton, was a classmate of John Maynard Keynes's uh, at Cambridge under Alfred Marshall. Um, so I try to tell that story of the paper in the 1930s as a kind of clash between uh, Keynes and, and the editor, in which both begin by sharing basic common assumptions about the way the economy works and Britain's position uh, in the world, and the way that Keynes begins to have uh, bigger and bigger doubts about that as the Great Depression uh, uh, gets deeper and deeper. And Leighton, despite sharing some of Keynes's views or being convinced by them, in part because he is um, he has to take into account the readership uh, of The Economist in the city of London, uh, is constrained in terms of what he can actually endorse, in terms of uh, where he can go, how far he can stray in terms of macroeconomic uh, unorthodoxy. So, so that's kind of one of the longer term causes is Keynesian, Keynesian influence on the paper via, via his students. Shorter term is that during the Second World War, who are Britain's allies? the New Deal United States and uh, 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 the Soviet Union. Um, so I think that the endorsement of full employment is a measure of, of this moment of crisis during the Second World War in which the two leading allies of the British state have already uh, um, moved fairly far in the direction of state planning uh, uh, and uh, away from the gold standard and, of course, any, 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 any simple idea of laissez-faire. So I think the full employment moment in 1942 uh, uh, is, 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 um, is reflects that. Uh, of course, I also emphasize, though, that as, as important as, as that is, that endorsement of full employment, in some ways, by the way, uh, the editor uh, at the time, Jeffrey Crowther, is, you know, criticizes labor for being timid when it comes to endorsing uh, mm. uh, 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 beverages plan and and uh, uh, you know being being uh, uh, too conservative, um, but that I try to stress that um, the ways in which uh, um, that uh, the Economist quickly turns on uh, uh, those who propound those very those very ideas. So um, you know I, I can go into that, but but basically you know that's that's the turning point, and then it, it doesn't last it doesn't last very long. Yes, full employment that that idea does. But the kinds of interventions that would have led to, you know, uh, a, a more socialistic economy or that might have um, allowed Britain to um, avoid some of the you know, monetary crises and, and currency crises that it faced in the in the in the in the next 30 years, that that's more complicated. So listeners can probably imagine what uh, the economist position was over the course of the 70s into the 80s uh, with Thatcher and Reagan and, and perhaps and before that uh, in response to what was going on in Chile in the early uh, 1970s, Pinochet and so on. Maybe we shouldn't dwell on that because there's a lot of stuff that uh, we'd like to discuss that happens uh, from the 90s onwards. So as a way of tackling that, and I'm going to start maybe in a, in a place which is uh, maybe a little bit kind of not where you'd expect, because uh, although it is the peak neoliberal epoch, uh, you know, at the end of the Cold War, the end of history, um, the thing I want to ask about is about cultural change, actually. So how has The Economist responded to cultural change and specifically the, dem the democratization of culture or what might call cultural populism? Um, so in today's times, it can't be that haughty. It has to speak in the in that and suggest that the policies it proposes or the reforms it proposes uh, will help uh, the common man, will help the ordinary person. Um, it can't be so, uh, I guess, uh, speak from so much from on high, uh, take such culturally elitist positions uh, in the way that it would have done, you know, perhaps until the perhaps until the 1960s, but perhaps even later than that. Uh, one way for me that it seemed to do this, especially in the 90s and 2000s, was to play a kind of 
social radical card at times or you know cultural radical card calling for the legalization of all drugs for instance or the abolition of the monarchy which you know it did in 1994 uh, or its position uh, in favor of gay marriage so uh maybe there's a bit of a curveball question but is there something about the end of the cold war that allowed for such laxity let's say uh of not upholding a cultural elitism anymore and uh trying to be more culturally populist i guess uh, yeah, no, that's a very that's a very interesting question and a good point. Uh, I'm trying to think about the ways that, uh, in which the end of the Cold War does or doesn't push forward that um, that social liberalism or what the economists would describe as social liberalism. Uh, certainly, it coincides with it. The economists in the 1940s to to 1980s does not take a particularly socially liberal or what we would call socially liberal line. And it's true that 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 its positions, especially in the United States, and I think this has something to do with it too, that uh, starting in the uh, 1970s, the economist makes an aggressive push into the U.S. market, and that is to the credit of Andrew Knight, who went on to become uh, chairman of News Corporation and uh, uh, involved in various shady transactions around the Daily Telegraph and all sorts of other uh, uh, people, but. Um, I think that that this 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 entry into the U.S. market, uh, where uh, you know, if you like, the British journalists who covered the United States were probably shocked at the puritanism um, uh, uh, that they found in, in the U.S. Uh, that the um, kind of the British laissez-faire attitudes towards things like um, you know, uh, 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 comparatively speaking, uh, sexual uh, freedom. Uh, or uh, the issue of gay marriage, uh, drug legalization. Um, uh, there are other examples. Um, kind of um, the economist p- pushed those things. Gun control, right? The economist mm. has has long taken a, a socially liberal position on gun control. And I think that, uh, especially for American readers who who basically don't, you know, m- many that I meet don't have a a good sense or clear sense of the kind of one the overall shape of, of liberalism. Because, of course, in the U.S. it means something quite different uh, or tends right. to mean something quite yeah. different. Uh, and also don't really have a sense of the overall kind of liberal worldview of the economist as applied to things like the economy. For them, the socially liberal part of the economist is key. It, it, it makes the economist, as you, as you suggest, seem sort of firmly in, in the sensible, reasonable camp. You know, you know, if you like socially liberal and, and, and fiscally conservative, that that kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, construct. Uh, uh, so, I mean, that's not entirely an answer to your question. I'm thinking through it, but um, I'm sort of adding to your remark about the Cold War, the um, positioning of the economists within a, a U.S. market in which social liberalism actually plays a, a large part in its appeal to, to, to its readers. Yeah, no, I mean, it is an interesting phase. I mean, I, I yeah, don't expect there to be a, a ready answer for, for it, but I mean, it's, I guess it's just interesting in that it, um, it, it, I guess it's one of the many episodes in which it it sort it sort of follows along with the tide, uh, despite it maybe it's sometimes pretensions of being um, I don't know somehow standing athwart from things and and having this position outside of uh, <laughs> outside of, uh, of of the of the blowing winds I suppose. Um, Speaking of, of blowing winds, actually, uh, I should pass on to George, which isn't a slight on George. It's actually a reference to the question wow. that he's going to ask. <laughs> That was yeah, nice uh, segue. Thanks. Um, actually, I'm not really going to talk about blowing winds that much. I'm um, I'm, I'm just going to blow V8. Um, no, but I think one thing we're particularly interested in this podcast is how liberalism is responding uh, both in theory and in practice to the what we call the end of the end of history. So back in episode 44, I'm sure listeners will uh, know we identified neoliberal order breakdown syndrome which we defined as the inability on the part of the liberal establishment to accept explain or respond to political change and especially brexit and trump and i think your book touches on a lot of related themes and one question that i'd have is whether you think um the economist as as a whole which has as we mentioned before these unsigned and often very strident arrogant even missives written from this very godlike position of omniscience um whether it's become less self-confident since the 2008 financial crisis i mean in in the immediate aftermath they might have been unrepentant and and willing and unwilling to accept any responsibility um but i think maybe things have changed a little bit since then could you tell our listeners maybe a bit more about the open future initiative they launched in 
April 2018. I mean, is it a sign that the Economist has become less self-confident, less less sure of um, of its position, or am I reading too much into it? No, I think it, I think it depends. Uh, yes, uh, openness, much much celebrated by 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 liberals who no longer want to talk about uh, uh, capitalism. Um, uh, also has the virtue of making anyone who opposes openness seem like a total lunatic, uh, uh, I guess, because who, who wants to live in a completely closed society? Um, at any rate, yeah, The Economist, uh, under its current editor, Zanny Mitten Beddoes, has uh, uh, um, very much engaged with, and this is in contrast to her predecessor, John Micklethwaite, uh, with sort of developments um, on the left and the right, um, and has sort of taken up the mantle of liberalism or retaken it up um, in, in what would seem like a slightly, you know, self-interrogative um, way. Um, one of those initiatives is the Open Futures Initiative, um, inviting speakers, uh, uh, you know, outside of the kind of uh, canon of liberal, acceptable liberal thinkers. Um, Beto's interviewed uh, Steve Bannon um, uh, the, maybe two years ago as part of that Open Futures Initiative. The Economist on the 175th anniversary ran a kind of manifesto about renewal of liberalism, as well as a kind of overview of what it's uh, achieved, what are its flaws, and how it might, you know, hope to, to move forward. So I don't know that I would call that a lack of self-confidence. It can be quite a confident move to sort of to acknowledge that liberalism mm-hmm. faces some kind of kind of crisis, and that liberals should uh, 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 take stock of that, react to that, and regroup. You know what I mean? So I think. It's uncharacteristic of the economist to, to be doing these things. Does yeah. that mean it lacks confidence in the future? I don't know. It will have been given a major boost by the outcome of the uh, election, I think, where um, although it had no liking for Boris Johnson uh, 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 in the conservative party he fronted, um, the, 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 the clear enemy was Jeremy Corbyn. And the, his, you know, from their perspective, return of the Labour Party to the failed um, uh, policies of the 1970s that threatened, you know, to 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 to, to, to plunge Britain back into a three-day week uh, lit only by candlelight. Uh, so I think, um, you know, I, I, I'm straying now a little bit from from your question, but um, you know, I think the when when Trump was elected, when Brexit happened. And, uh, you know, there were a few other uh, instances. Renzi lost his uh, referendum and there were other kind of calls that they, they did, didn't quite see. I think that was a moment of, of real crisis. So 2008 right. and the financial crisis wasn't a moment of self-reflection at all for the yeah. economist. Uh, and then around the time of sort of these, these real setbacks, the election of Trump in particular and Brexit in particular, I think that yeah. was a moment where that some serious self-doubt began to creep in, mm. as well as some some self-contradiction. So mm. that, you know, you'd read one thing in the Badgett column, uh, you know, one week uh, attacking Corbyn as, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Maoist. And then a week mm. later, you'd say, well, he's really an effective entrepreneur of the left. Mm. And, you know, so I, I would sort of say that that was a moment of, but I, but I you know, it, 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 if, those, if those knocks keep coming, then perhaps we will see some, some signs of, of a lack of confidence. But I don't right. know that we've seen seen that at the moment Mm. it's interesting that a magazine such as the economist which tries to take a you know a a god's eye view of things uh should be so shaken though at the same time i guess you know i think you point out at at some point in the book you know that uh there are recourses to kind of cold war rhetoric uh used against corbyn and that of course i mean i guess for for liberals especially those of a certain generation who were raised during the cold war um or came to maturity during the cold war uh quite like that arrangement because of the role that allowed them to play as you know freedom fighters against the soviet empire and so on uh and and you know perhaps a certain nostalgia for that period and maybe a slight joy in the fact that it's able to fulminate against a person like Corbyn um, for being a socialist. And in, in that regard, it might give them more. Yeah, you know, it's always nice to have a good enemy to fight against, I guess. So I don't know if there's if you find something like that in The Economist today. Yeah, I would. I, yeah, what I would add is that what I what I find interesting, and, and this is true of The Economist, but it, it, it takes place outside The Economist, you know, Martin Wolf in the Financial Times, you know, the IMF itself 
admits yeah. there's, you know, that, that, that the central bank's quantitative easing is no longer going to cut it and that states are going to have to spend money on infrastructure, on social services, right? I mean, these are not left-wing revolutionaries. Wolf says the same in his columns in the FT. Corbyn comes around with a credible plan to, you know, have a green industrial revolution and possibly save us from climate catastrophe uh, and, you know, maybe to reverse the tuition increases that, that are a recent phenomenon so that students don't graduate from, from college with massively in debt. You know, so in other words, quite sensible and, you know, what would have been mainstream social democratic policies just a few decades ago. And all of a sudden it is, as you say, hysteria. You know, we couldn't possibly uh, uh, have have this guy in power. He's a he's a fool. He's a terrorist. He's a lout. He's not smart. He's he's. Uh, I'm thinking of other smears against him. He's an anti-Semite, of course. Uh, uh, or, or, or you know, uh, at one point they were saying he wasn't up to it in terms of health. You know. So I, I'm just saying that there's a there's um you know, the Economist again a, little, a week ago uh, said that the uh, you know that uh, you, strong unions indicated a strong economy, so that we should encourage uh, unionization. The, the week before that, it, 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 it told Emmanuel Macron to crush the strikers in France with an iron hand. So the, 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 uh, that's, this, my contribution to, um, uh, to your neoliberal order, uh, disorder, is to suggest that there is a schizophrenic element mm-hmm. to this as well, where liberals are, are ready at this point, after their own lost decade, to admit that something has got to the change in the way that this economy is structured, but they are unwilling to accept those who offer the, the possible solutions or ways out of the crises that they themselves, and this I think is the extent to which liberals are themselves responsible for the current crises, uh, do not realize, um, they're unwilling to accept those, those, those solutions. Well, you've to an extent uh, preempted the question I was going to ask. I mean, one thing, you know, with regard to the French, uh, you know, Macron's smashing of uh, of the strikes in, in France, you know, there's always a long tradition of The Economist of I mean, what's, being, what's good for the goose isn't good for the gander, of course, uh, what it preaches abroad, some whatever authoritarian solutions necessary to guarantee free trade or free markets uh, are often measures which wouldn't be acceptable uh, in Britain for it. Uh, so there's always, I think that's a long running contradiction in it uh, or hypocrisy. Um, but the, the other one is that, uh, you know, the liberalism as expressed by the economists seems to be, pers- and I think this might be even more so in recent periods, but, it, you know, persistently blind to the enemies that it generates. Uh and I wonder, yeah, if you have a if you have a way of accounting for this, uh, so you know it, it supports the war in Afghanistan, the the war against uh, the the second Gulf War, uh, the intervention in Libya as well, um, and it justifies it by saying, well, you know, this is a clear evil in Islamism, so it's right that it should be fought, uh, as if that were the end of that, uh, ignoring the longer history that you know the rise of Islamism is to an extent a product of liberal anti communism. Uh, and, and, and the way it's so persistently blind to, to these uh, historical developments and the ways in which its own previous actions or recommendations come to blow up in its face, um, justifying further war. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, do, do you have yeah. a, a, an explanation for why, for this blindness? Uh, do I have an explanation for it? I don't know that I have an explanation for it, but I would say that of all of the of, of the of the three um, categories that structure my book, democracy, finance, and empire, um, the 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 sort of the, the the one that we've seen the least movement on, uh, uh, the least willingness to acknowledge, is a constitutive fault of liberalism, uh, and 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 at the very least, kind of deeply embedded within its worldview, um, is that is empire. Um, you know, the unwillingness to see the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, the, the, the interventions in Syria, Libya, um, uh, uh, the sort of the attack on uh, Iran, you know, the sanctions against Iran, which should be considered an act of war in itself, as well as now this uh, heinous assassination of a senior Iranian official, a country the United States is not at war with in Iraq, another country the United States is not at war with, which violates the United States' own laws, let alone leaving aside international law, the unwillingness to see those those things as connected or as the United States as as an aggressor in those 
conflicts is, is, is what I see as kind of the, it, it seems to be the pillar of liberalism that um, in the United States certainly is, is the least questioned. And I don't think that that is unique to the economist. There's something important about uh, the sort of absence of empire, the erasure of empire as a system, as a structure, as a set of operations, as a, as a, as a form of military aggression, that, that, that it is deeply necessary to hide. Uh, and, you know, you, you really wouldn't know that the U.S. had, had engaged in, in, a, in a deeply, um, you know, um, in an act, you know, that risked war given the sorts of coverage of it in the United States uh, in the last couple of weeks, alone among Democratic contenders for, for the nomination, Bernie Sanders at least had the, uh, you know, decency to call it an assassination for which he was roundly reproached by uh, none other than, you know, um, uh, uh, than, than Michael Bloomberg. Uh, so, you know, I, I would kind of zoom out and say that, that um, liberals have, have an interest in not seeing or understanding empire as as uh, as a structure, but but merely evaluating each act of imperial intervention abroad on a discrete case by case basis, which may be required because you know uh, uh, for on uh, grounds of human rights or 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 or, or to protect uh, you know a minority community uh, uh, or for 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 another reason that that kind of fits more neatly with um, some rather precious uh, 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 liberal value. Mm. Well, I mean, it actually just occurred to me hearing you discuss that, and I think it's a good explanation, but it also seems to, uh, th- this kind of case-by-case basis, always looking forward, not not uh, venturing into any historical examinations of what might have led to the rise of such and such, which now needs to be defeated. It's just, let's look forward, let's resolve this practical problem in front of us, is, an, is a little bit uh, reflective of the sort of business mindset, which was there at the very founding of the magazine, that these are business people who have practical issues that need solving, and we bring this uh, outlook to the world of politics, and we inform business people of what's going on in politics so that they can practically respond to these things. And in a way, uh, I guess its attitude to empire is is much the same, like, let's just move on to the next thing, let's not look backwards, let's not uh, indulge in any historical analysis, we just need to solve this next problem that's in front of us. Um, but uh, I, I think we should maybe. It's, it's good. It's good. Go it's on. good. Raw, it's good raw material for for Marxists who do want to think about empire as a structure. Though it does provide some really excellent raw material. So mm. I encourage yeah. any any listeners who want to use it to make those sorts of claims to to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think to to round out this last section uh, where we talk maybe a little bit more about the Economist actually as a as a publication. Um, because I'm sure uh, lots of our listeners love to hate it. So that's what we should finish on. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Phil. Mm. Yeah, well, just segueing from that, Alexander, um, should socialists, should left-wing people, should they read The Economist, do you think? Uh, yes. I think, they, I think they should. I think, I think, uh, I, I think it's a... Well, you, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I tend to think, and, and this certainly in the past, uh, and in certain ways continues to be the, the case with me, uh, there is a reluctance on the part of the left to read the enemy uh, or to grapple with the enemy. At least I think this is the case sometimes. Um, you know, we'd rather read uplifting texts by fellow Marxists and revolutionaries or about struggles for social equality uh, uh, and, and, and heroic moments of victory. But there's a case for, you know, in a Benjaminian way, uh, looking very hard at, 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 at our own moments of defeat uh, as well as um, what uh, what our what our enemies or what um, what those who, who who maybe hold the reins of power uh, think and do, and so I kind of think that uh, reading The Economist, um, you know, is 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 very useful to 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 sort of um, you know to, to be able to do that. And of course, it is also useful just on the basis of you know it does give you a record of w- what is happening in in the world, even if you do have to do a bit of ideological filtration or something, um, you know, to get past some of the tone. I was going to say, in fact, I think it's one of the standout features of the, notwithstanding the incredibly irritating pompous tone that you, that you mentioned, it's one of the standout features of the magazine, 
that it um, is the sheer range of things that it covers and the geographic range that it has as well, um, Africa, Asia. Um, and it has some truly great correspondence on its um, on its books, I think, as well, um, reporting from particular regions. Um, so all of those are good things, I think. And a, yeah, lot, of, um, a lot of diagrams, a lot of infographics. Um, yeah, they could so, as well. Yeah. But, yeah, so, so totally. I, these, that's, I completely agree. That that, that that's part of the the story. Yeah. Um, the so I guess um, the next question I, is what is next for the Economist after um, uh, you've got like a five hundred page book looking in um, uh, great detail at the history, and I wonder if that puts you in a position to um, do a little bit of forecasting for us. So you say. Um, more than half the readers are from North America at this point, linking to your point about the aggressive market expansion into North America. And apparently, um, at some point, more than 20% claimed ownership of a seller of vintage wines, which um, is a great way to characterize a particular demographic. Um, so uh, could you tell us a bit about what you think is next for The Economist? Well, wine caves have also really been in the news lately, too. So it's, <laughs> right. it's, a, it's good you mentioned that. I wonder what um, percentage are uh, uh, owners of wine caves, not just sellers, but yeah. whole caves. I'm speaking to you from a wine cave, actually. That's why the reception <laughs> is not good. Um, I haven't drunk any of it, though, uh, any of the wine. Anyway, um, so what is what is next for The Economist? Well, I mean, some clues are provided by um, by what The Economist is, is, is doing to, to, to market the paper. Um, I think they... You know, they, they want to attract new and younger readers in the United States, at least. I don't know if this is true in, in, in Britain, but um, in urban centers, uh, The Economist has these sort of red trucks that uh, offer people, you know, civet feces, coffee or, um, you know, kind of techno futuristic food products designed to, I guess, suggest to readers what capitalism still has up its sleeve in terms of solving various crises uh, to do with, uh, I don't know, demographics, uh, food provision and climate change, uh, uh, as well as offering, obviously, subscriptions to the newspaper. Uh, I think that they've also made a hugely aggressive push into social media, on Snapchat, on, uh, you know, on Facebook, and uh, are looking to win new and younger readers, as well as um, readers who skew less towards the male side of, of things because uh, because economist readers have, have, have tended to be majoritarily uh, 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 male. So I think, um, you know, and then in terms of the actual covers of The Economist and, and what, what is on the cover, you know, I think you'll see a, 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 that geopolitics, and this is in line with maybe, I think, was it Alex's question uh, before about the social liberalism of the economist, yeah, exactly, um, yeah. lifestyle issues, things to do with technological breakthroughs, how to cure cancer, quantum, quantum computing. Um, you know, uh, uh, is there life on other planets? So, you know, I think the current editor calls this mind stretching journalism. So I think you'll see some, you know, the, the kind of a, a de-emphasis on some of what I am, some of what I talk about in the book to do with empire and finance capitalism um, and a kind of a stronger focus on, on you know, a kind of an optimistic view of, 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 of what globalization can, can achieve and what the, you know, the forces of production can, can, uh, can, can solve for us. But all the while, you know, still, 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 I think, pushing pretty, pretty hard on the, on the three points that I, that I mentioned where, where capitalism conflicts with democracy and, uh, where the, the necessities of empire are, 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 are found, uh, you know, I, I don't see uh, the, the liberalism, the guiding, the kind of the guiding uh, uh, lights of that liberalism uh, uh, changing all that much in the near term. So we got one. Um, we got one final question for you, which is if you could tell us about your the review of your book about the Economist in the Economist. <laughs> yes. You want this is a dangerous question to ask an author to talk about the review of their own book. <laughs> well, in, like in the ben, magazine like that they talk about, squared. even better. So, <laughs> you, 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 well, I mean, I, I made a joke when it came out that um, it was a bit like being broken up with uh, after a long relationship by text message. Um, <laughs> you know that uh, you know here I here I here I've gone to the trouble of taking their 
their intellectual production very, very seriously. And I, you know, bless uh, Anthony Gottlieb's heart. He does acknowledge that. He says that I take them very seriously, but as an engagement with, or as a counter blast to my criticisms of the economist, it fell pretty flat. Uh, you know, he, he, he just outlined some of the charges that I make against the economist and implies that, um, you know, only a rabid Marxist would dare to describe the Irish famine as a Holocaust or to, um, <laughs> you know, talk about the, I don't know, blowing up of Indian set boys at the mouths of cannons uh, in reprisal for the Indian rebellion uh, in the uh, 1857, um, as, as, as though these were indecent things to mention and I should be somewhat uh, chastened, you know, so, but, but of course, no, no counter response is given other than the rather uh, um, or pat one that capitalism has produced uh, untold levels of poverty reduction and, um, um, you know, uh, over the last 40 years, its triumph has, has you know, uh, um, has been a great marvel for the, for the poor and downtrodden of this world. So, you know, I mean, we could talk about whether that's true either, but uh, I, 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 I was amused uh, on, on the other hand, uh, by the tone, which which felt uh, very much uh, consistent with the kinds of attitudes and characters that I describe in my book. Um, but, you know, I, I thought that the intellectual force of it was a bit blunted. But then I would say that. Is it true that you're a rapid Marxist? <laughs> Um, my appearance, I think my appearance on this podcast is not going to do anything to dispel that notion. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alexander, that's been, uh, yeah. that's been great talking to you. Um, it's a fascinating book. I would encourage readers to, to buy it and to read it. It's Liberalism at Large, The World According to the Economist by Alexander Zevin. It's out now on Verso. It's a relatively hefty book, but just to assuage listeners, a good quarter of it is footnotes and bibliography, as befits such a well-researched book. And even if you don't read it from cover to cover uh, in one straight read, it's actually a great book to dip into. And I know I'll be referring back to it, looking for what The Economist's position was on India in the 1940s, or Chile in the 1970s, or what its exact position was on the Iraq War. Uh, it's a brilliant book. Thank you so much. All right, that's it for Alpha Bunga Bunga this week. Coming up over the next couple of weeks, we've got discussions on the future of environmentalism, the Oscars, music at the end of the end of history, the relevance of J.G. Ballard, and the idea and myth of Singapore. All that to come. If you're interested in having access to all of that, you need to sign up at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash bungacast. That's it for now. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.